Hi, this is SynthChaser from SynthChaser.com. Today we're going to be repairing this Memory Moog Plus. I picked up a pair of broken Memory Moogs over the past few years with the intent to develop some new upgrades for them. But until now, they've just been sitting around in their cases. So I just busted this one out and we're going to get it up and running. This video by no means is going to show a complete restoration job and by the end of the video I'm not expecting the synth to work 100% and sound perfect. I just want to get it up and running and making sound. And in the process I want to give you a tour of the inside and how the memory mode works. So where this stands now is we can turn it on and it boots up and it responds to controls. We can hit auto-tune and sometimes all six voices pass auto-tune, sometimes just five pass. So let's see what happens here. So tell us in just a second. So this time it says six tunes, so all of the voices pass auto-tune. Uh, but the problem that we're going to be fixing today is that there's, there's just no output. Before we open up the synthesizer, let's verify that all the voices are enabled in the firmware. Like other poly synths from this era, like the Oberheim OB series, the memory mode gives you a way to disable voices that don't tune. On the OBX and OBXA, you flip up the lid and use some dip switches located underneath to disable some of the voices. On the OB8, you use your page 2 menu. And on the memory mode, you do it by entering some top secret service codes. So this part is just between you and me, okay? So we make sure all the voices are enabled by hitting C4 and then enter. So it says defeat and here we could enter the number of a voice that we want to dis disable but in this case we want to make sure that all the voices are enabled. So we hit enter again and it says enabled meaning all voices are enabled. Uh, but sadly we still don't have any output and it seems like I rarely get any lucky breaks. So let's get the memory Moog open. To do that, we're gonna remove 12 screws. Nine of them are on the bottom, three on this side, three in the front, three on this side, and three are on the back panel. And to get this opened up without having to turn it on its side or upside down, I'm going to slide the synthesizer over the edge of my bench, and then I can get access to those screws underneath. So now we've got the synth open and there's a lot of stuff going on in here. Before we go diving in to solve our problem, let's take a little tour around the inside like we did on our recent Mini Moog video. Let's start back here with the weakest link of the memory Moog, the power supply. For those of you familiar with the Poly Moog, this power supply is going to look familiar because it's the exact same supply. The power supply provides three rails, plus and minus 15 volts and plus 5 volts. Each of these rails is based around the now obsolete 723 voltage regulator using a pass transistor to allow for a higher current than the chip itself can handle. However, the pass transistors they use are in these WIMPY TO220 packages, which makes the chip overheating a real problem. So they've attached them to this massive heat sink and they've put a noisy fan inside the synthesizer trying to keep things running cool enough. I'll come back to the memory mode power supply soon in another video. In the upper half of the case, there's not a lot of interesting stuff. Here we have the pitch and modulation wheels, a little circuit board for the octave transpose switches, and two large circuit boards here called the left and right side control boards. These boards basically have all the switches, LEDs, and pots. And because it would be really cumbersome to have one wire connecting each pot, LED, or switch to the other boards, they're arranged into matrices of rows and columns, and there's a little bit of circuitry on this board that multiplexes them. So the state of several switches or pots can be transmitted over the same wire. If you're curious for more details about how this works, I have a video where I explain switch matrices and troubleshoot a problem with the switch matrix on the keybed of an Oberheim OBXA. Look for my video, Synth Chaser number 95. Because this is a Memory Moog Plus, it has MIDI, so it has this extra board which adds the MIDI jacks, which you can see located right here at the bottom on the back panel. Moving along on the right side, down here we have a stack of six identical circuit boards. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six. They're the voice cards, and the Memory Moog is a six-voice synthesizer. 
One of the coolest things about the Memory Moog is unlike most other poly synths of the day which had two oscillators per voice, the Memory Moog had three oscillators per voice, each with a variety of wave shape options. For the oscillators, they used the Curtis CEM3340 chip, which is a voltage-controlled oscillator on a single chip and was used by other poly synths of the day including the Oberheim OBXA and the Sequential Circuits Prophet 5. So here on the voice cards we see one, two, three CEM3340 chips representing oscillator one, two, and three. There's a whole bunch of 4016 and 4066 CMOS analog switches used to select waveforms and to route signals around on the voice cards. And up here in the upper right-hand corner of the voice card is the classic Moog ladder filter that gives the fat sound you've come to expect from a Moog synth. And you can actually see the individual transistors that make up the ladder filter over here. These round cans are matched pairs of transistors, which were interestingly only used on the top and bottom rungs of the ladder filter. Finally, each voice board has its own VCA based around the 3080 OTA, which was commonly used in most synthesizers of the day. Next to the voice cards here, we have the common analog board. On this board, we have an LFO, which is also based around the 3340 Curtis chip. Tucked under these wires here, we have a noise generator, which is based on the MM5837 noise chip that Moog used in all its synths of that era. And finally, there's a bunch of analog switches and op-amp buffers that switch, sum, and route all the different modulation sources to the oscillators, control voltage, and pulse widths, as well as the filters. This board also mixes the outputs from the six voice cards and uh, outputs them to the rear panel and to the headphone jack. In fact, here we can see the outputs from the six voice cards and a shield from their cable coming into the common analog board. Moving over to the left, we have our CPU board, which they call the digital board. Offhand, I think the memory Moog and the source were the only vintage Moog synths to use a CPU chip. Sometimes people are surprised that some of their favorite analog synths have a CPU inside it. And they ask me, well, if it has a CPU, isn't it a digital synthesizer? And the answer has to do with how the audio signal you hear with your ears is generated. Even though this has a CPU, the sound you hear comes from pure analog oscillator chips that goes through analog transistor filters, which we've seen. It's not a waveform loaded from a data table with some digital effects applied to it by the CPU. Yeah, there's a CPU, but the CPU just runs the user interface and routes the signals, but the signals themselves are coming from pure analog sources. Anyway, getting back on track, uh, this digital board would normally have the Z80 CPU, but because this is the Memory Moog Plus, it breaks it out to another board. So there's a ribbon cable connecting it up to that MIDI board that we saw, and the Z80 CPU chip is on there. There's some ROMs under here, and some RAMs. Uh, the ROMs contain the firmware of the Memory Moog, that is, they instruct the CPU what to do. The RAM chips store the presets. And there's a battery backup here, so that keeps the RAMs powered when you switch off the synthesizers so you don't lose your presets. And then there's a bunch of other TTL chips that manage the CPU's address and data bus so the CPU can communicate with the matrices of switches, LEDs, and pots that we saw earlier. And finally, there's a couple of boards that we can't see right now, but honestly, they're not very interesting. Under the key bed and kind of sticking out here is a board called the Contour and Glide board. Basically, it has 12 individual ADSR envelope generators, all based around the 3310 Curtis envelope generator chip. So there's six loudness envelopes, one for each voice, six filter envelopes, one for each voice. And it also has six individual portamento or glide circuits and a mono or unison glide circuit. So tucked away underneath the CPU and common analog boards are what they call the DMUX board. And the DMUX board does just that. It takes a digital address coming from the CPU and demultiplexes it to an analog memory location called a sample and hold. And when I use the term sample and hold in this context, it's different from the sample and hold effect that you use for modulation. But the premise is similar. The way we create a memory that stores an analog voltage value is by putting a low leakage capacitor in front of an op-amp buffer. The idea is there's very little loss to the voltage stored on the capacitor due to the low leakage nature of the capacitor and the high impedance input of the op-amp. So what voltage is placed across that capacitor stays there 
and on the output of the op amp buffer, and it's made available to the synth's analog circuitry until a new value is placed there by the CPU. And speaking of that, because the CPU outputs digital data, the digital data gets run through a 12-bit digital-to-analog converter, or DAC, to get converted to an analog voltage, which is then stored on those capacitors. Okay, now that we have some high-level knowledge of how this synthesizer works, we can come up with a plan to troubleshoot it. So this is how I've got it set up. I've got my oscilloscope set up on the bench next to it. Uh, because I have the panel tilted back, I'm listening from the headphone output. So I think a good place to start looking would be right here on this connector. This is the connector that takes the outputs from the individual voice cards and brings it here to the final VCA and output stage for the headphones and the uh, output jack. So we can probe this connector and see if we're getting any output from the voices and then we can kind of narrow down where we need to look for our problem. So I'm going to probe on this connector and I'm going to hit some keys and actually I do see I do see some output there on the oscilloscope. That, I'll make it a, a little larger here, but that does look like an audio waveform that I'm seeing here. So it looks like we're getting output from the voice card, but for whatever reason we're not hearing it. It's not making it out. So the problem could be with the final VCA or it could be with some op amp buffers that drive the headphones or the, uh, the output jack. So let's get the schematic and have a look. So we were looking right here on this connector, and this is the outputs from the voice cards, and we were looking at pin 1, which is voice F, and we were seeing an audio signal. So combined with the other ones, this comes across a capacitor here and goes into the CEM3360, two stages of that, and then into an op amp, and then it comes out to this next connector, which takes it to the volume controls. So we can look at the inputs, pin 6 and uh, input of this CEM3360 VCA chip. Uh, the output is on pin 2. And we can look at the next stage and then we can look at that op amp all the way to that connector and see if, uh, if we find our problem. So we're going to look at this CEM3360 chip and the first stage of that input is pin 6. So 2, 4, 6. And it's a lower level signal than before but we can see our audio signal is still there. And now we'll go over the output, which is pin 2, and our signal's still there. So the next stage comes in on pin 9, which is here, and it comes out on pin 13, which is here. So we're not losing our signal here. The Curtis chip seems to be okay. So the next one that we're going to look at is uh, op amp uh, U7. Pin 5 is the input. So this is a little difficult to get the probe in there. So it's wedged between this connector. But uh, there's the input on pin 5 and the output on pin 7. So we're still good at that point. So next thing we're going to check is we're going to check the, um, the connectors to the volume control. Um, the connectors on the synthesizer are notoriously lousy. So it's possible there could be a bad connector and we lose our signal on the way up to the volume control or on the way back from the volume control. So this connector here next to the op amp, which you probably can't see because it's blocked by these wires, is the connection that takes the uh, audio signal up to the volume controls for both the master volume and the headphone volume and then brings it back down after it runs it through those potentiometers. Okay, so there's our signal coming out on pin 4 and then it comes back in for the uh, output jack, the high level output jack on pin 7, which is tucked down here. So pin 7, let me get my probe on it. There it is, it's coming back from the, uh, the volume pot. And since we're listening right now to the headphone volumes, let's check out that one. The headphone volume pot. Signal is making it back from there. So our signal made it back in here uh, and here for the headphones and the output jacks. So there's just really an op amp and another connector that takes it up to the jack that's left. So let's check these op amps. So first I'm going to take a look at the high level output even though that's not what we're listening to. It's that same op amp chip U7 
7 that we were just looking at here next to the connector. So the input is on pin 3. So there's the input and the output is pin 1. Interesting! We're getting very close to the end of our signal chain and we still still have it. I'll check this other op amp, the one that drives the headphones. So that's a LM386 and it's U8. So that chip is up here and the input is on pin 3, which is here. So it's a little lower level here, but I still see it. And the output is on pin 5. So that's this one over here. Looks like it has a little DC offset, but it's still there. Interesting. So now we need to take a look at the connector that takes those from this board up to the jacks themselves. So we followed our signal all the way to here and here and we still have it on both of these separate signal paths. Uh, so then it comes over to this connector P27 where it carries it up to the uh, to the jacks. So the next place we'll check are here on these connectors. The connector that takes these outputs and brings them up to the jacks on the back and on the front for the headphones is this connector here which is P27 and we're looking for headphones we're looking on pin 5 which should be black so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and we, we still have the signal and I'm I'm not probing the header underneath, I'm actually probing the contact that, that's gripping the wire. So this connection should be good and we're seeing the signal here. And it, you can see the DC offset that we saw earlier is removed because it went through a capacitor. But uh, let's check the high level output which is pin 4. and I still see it there I still see the signal there so this is, this is getting interesting so we'll follow this cable along these shielded cables come along here and they go down here directly to the jack and this one goes up to the headphone jack so it's not another connector so this is kind of funny actually. Um, so we pretty much eliminated everything with the synthesizer except the, the jacks themselves. Uh, so I, I went and I checked the, uh, the cable that's actually going to my amp. And uh, I, I put a second cable in and it works. So the problem actually turned out to be a, a bad cable to my amp. That's funny how I was just saying I never get any lucky breaks because this is about as lucky as they come. The problem was just that bad cable to my amp. I assume there had to be something wrong with the synth because I was told it was broken when I bought it and I got it cheap for parts or repair. I would have never thought to check my cable from the start, particularly since it was working last time I used it. I guess that's about as lucky as I could hope to get. Awesome. So I fiddled around with it for a few minutes now, and it sounds surprisingly good for a synthesizer that was supposedly broken. Anyway, while the repair might have been a bit anticlimactic, I hope you still enjoyed this look inside one of the best vintage polysynths out there. I'd like to give a big thank you to everyone who subscribed to my channel. I'll be back soon and we'll open up another vintage analog synthesizer. I'm SynthChaser from SynthChaser.com. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Yeah.